Okay, this lecture is going to cover four different chapters out of the Hepworth text. As I mentioned in the course itself, I looked for some ways to divide this into two different lectures just for the sake of having them be shorter, but there's really not a good way to divide this in half, and so I'm just going to go ahead and present it all at once. As you can see, these topics all relate very closely to the idea of relationship building and communicating understanding with your client and, and effective interviewing skills and techniques, and so I think they blend together very naturally. You might also notice if you're reading the Gambrel text that these topics have an overlap with what's covered in that text in these chapters as well. However, there's enough of a difference in the two of them that I really think they complement rather than repeat complement with an E meaning complete rather than repeat concepts too much. So onward we go. There are some guidelines that uh, Hepworth proposes in the beginning of these chapters to suggest the kinds of things that we need to be sure to do when we are establishing our roles early in the treatment relationship. And this includes, first of all, of course, determining the expectations of the client and placing some emphasis on the client responsibility for working on, on their particular objectives and goals, uh, as well as talking about the difficulties that are going to be a part of that process. And that may be some of that uh, cost-benefit analysis that is talked about in, in our other readings, where the uh, client may be, will be gaining things by achieving those goals, but it may, may, might also be giving up some things or need to give up some things in the process of achieving goals that necessarily aren't going to be very easy to give up. Of course, the social worker's own roles are clarified at this stage. And although this is true for an adult as well, there's a, an emphasis placed on the fact that if you have a, a child client, you also want to accurately convey what he or she can expect from the worker and what is expected from uh, the child himself or herself as well. Now, you're going to do that with the adults in any event, but uh, you, you're going to have to phrase this in ways that, uh, particularly with younger children, that perhaps the child can, under, can understand more fully. You're also going to have some communication early on in your treatment about informed consent, about confidentiality, and about agency policies that might impact your interaction with the client. This includes uh, defining limits, uh, possibilities, client rights, that kind of thing. Um, this communication also should be carried out in a genuine fashion, meaning that you don't just kind of skim through informed consent or say, here, this tells you, you know, that you have a right to, to know what I'm doing, assign the bottom line, but, but actually go through the informed consent uh, concept. And, and the, if you have, most agencies now have a document about client rights and informed consent, going through that and explaining what that is in, in layman's terms and taking a professional jargon out of it as much as possible. And again, if, if the uh, client's a child, do provide some, ex, uh, some um, particularly explicit explanations about privacy and confidentiality. Some of those issues are different when there's a child because parents have some rights to know what's going on in the treatment relationship or treat, at least uh, rights to see the child's records in most cases. And so you want to talk about that some with the child and, and probably also with the parents early on. And uh, so that the parents understand that you want to be able to afford the child some privacy and confidentiality as well. But you have to be careful about that to ensure that you don't put up a wall between the parents and the children because the parents do need to know um, in one fashion or another what's happening with the child in treatment. Um, also, I just want to emphasize here that uh, when you talk about confidentiality, also be sure you spell out the limits of confidentiality with your clients, adult and child alike. And for children, that does include the fact that parents may be able to gain access to, to your records, but also includes things, the traditional things like uh, the client being a danger to self or others, or when there are allegations that uh, could be abuse or neglect, those things uh, should be reported. In, in determining, um, by the way, what is abuse, uh, what constitutes abuse, you know, the statutes in Alaska, I believe, say that if you have reason to believe that abuse or neglect may be occurring in, in a relationship that you have an obligation to report that to the Child Protection Authority's Office of Children's Services within 24 hours. Now, that's not that's not necessarily an obligation that you're gonna you can transfer to other people. Although, if if um, 
uh, at, at times I have asked parents to report those things to OCS and then follow it up with OCS to be sure they were reported. Um, but, but you do have a legal obligation to make sure that, that your suspected abuse or neglect is reported. Um, if it doesn't require that you do an investigation to ensure that it is abusive, you're, you are protected under Good Samaritan law when you, when you make a report of suspected abuse or neglect uh, in good faith. When you make those reports in good faith, you can't be sued by the client or others. But um, it's very important that, uh, that it's clear to your clients that you have these obligations and that you, that you will follow through. You don't need to investigate. As I say, just be sure that you have reason to believe that abuse or neglect may be occurring and that's your, that's your, your cue to make a report. Now we talk about the facilitative conditions. Uh, once again, this, this should look pretty familiar to you and this really ties back to the um, Carl Rogers' three necessary and sufficient conditions for a therapeutic change. Empathy, um, genuineness, and um, unconditional positive regard. Uh, again, in some different, different terminology, but essentially the same concepts here. Now, to communicate empathy, uh, in, it involves our, our ability to accurately and sensitively perceive the feelings of the client, first of all. We have to be able to be tuned in to recognize what those feelings may be in order to communicate um, you know, a sense of empathy for the, for the client's situation. And then to be able to effectively communicate that to your client as well. So we have to be able to develop an awareness of, of the full spectrum of human emotions. And in one or two of our textbooks, you know, there are charts and tables with all these different feelings, words, and, and you see them in a variety of different situations. You know, if you're working with children, uh, there, there are some excellent um, charts, posters that you can, that you can hang in your office that have facial expressions, sort of little emoticons, we call them now, and those, but they go back before the day of emoticons, and, and they're just little smileys and sad faces and different things that express, uh, that put a, put a picture on, on different feelings, and you can use the feeling chart sometimes to help children identify what they're feeling if they don't have words for that, as they often don't, but um, in any event, uh, we have to, we have to know what the, what the range of emotions are might be a little more difficult and I, I say this uh, as a male myself but for a male sometimes the sensitivity to that range of emotions is a little more difficult because we've really been socialized typically at least we've been socialized away from perceiving all those different gradations uh, of emotions and things that again typically and I don't mean to be stereo to be stereotyping but that Typically, traditional feminine socialization um, exposes women to an understanding and sensitivity to that wider range than, than males. But men can get it too. Sometimes women have difficulty getting it, so don't don't uh, please don't take offense at what I said. But uh, we have to be aware of that range, regardless, in order to be able to express empathy in, in our uh, and experience empathy in in our work with clients, and then again to be able to. Uh, verbalize the emotions that we see the clients are are dealing with and being able to do this really does help the clients uh, and the clients growth a great deal in the treatment relationship and there's a lot of different ways that and or different times that we might use empathic communication and here's a list of some of those things just in establishing relationships and, and kind of staying in in touch with the emotions of clients as as things go along in assessing their problems also in picking up on nonverbal messages the clients uh, provide to us uh, perceiving uh, anger developing and those kinds of things and managing that anger uh, facilitating discussions in groups or in conjoint sessions between family members or, or marital partners, those kinds of things. And, and also um, through our own modeling of, of uh, empathy and being able to um, communicate empathy to another person, we're, we're really, we're modeling for the client also and can encourage them to develop the same, or him or her, to develop the same skills. Hepworth uh, shares uh, actually six different levels of empathic communication and you can see obviously they run from zero to five and uh, uh, 
there's a lot of people out there that are level zero with this and I hope that we're higher than this and and uh, one thing that's uh, um, worth noting is that level five level of empathic responding is one that isn't really found very often in worker client communication it really is a higher level um, you know a little like self-actualization in the scale of of empathic communication I think to be able to do that and and I think we all at one time or another in our interactions with clients reach that momentarily and can communicate effectively like that but but it is um, sort of the gold standard of empathy and is something that uh, most of us will aspire to most of the time in our day-to-day -day work and not always be able to achieve but hopefully we can move closer in that direction and so you'll see that that uh, in the the levels as the levels go up there's a greater ability to to connect with some of the content of what client is saying in uh, and in communicating that back um, then responding to superficial feelings and uh, those kinds of things and then then beginning to identify some of the underlying feelings just below the surface and ultimately being able to develop uh, an ability to to connect and communicate um, the deeper uh, underlying or the feelings that lie deeper under the surface with the clients that really can advance their um, recognition of what's going on with them and, and their opportunity to grow some in their understanding of self and their situation. And so empathy is, empathy is a very powerful tool in our, in our toolkit and is something that we want to develop our ability to, to utilize as much as possible. Now, there are skills that are used in communicating, acknowledging client messages, encouraging the exploration of problems. And, and uh, in fact, uh, this uh, paradigm here for reciprocal empathy is, is one of those things I think that uh, is a part of, it says reaching level three in, in that communication skill, sc scale we were just looking at where the worker captures uh, content and superficial feelings, surface feelings in a client's message, and then frames those message in a way that uh, really goes beyond just restating what the client says but helps the client to grow a little bit in their recognition of what's going on what's going on um, and the response here by the way focuses on a client's message it doesn't have to do with any of the workers ideas and so this paradigm is you feel something about something because something and a couple examples here one example at least you feel panicky about talking to your dad because you can't say what what you want to say without falling apart you know that's after a client has been telling you about you know a lot of anxiety the client has about uh, you know an interaction with with a parent that's coming up um, and it's also recommended that you vary your language so that you don't wind up becoming repetitive in what you say it begins to be off puttish if you do that and so instead of saying you feel all the time you can start out with the question could it be that uh, i wonder if as i hear it you that that kind of thing so that that uh, you know you're introducing the the empathic uh, reinterpretation let's say the feedback different with different phrases Authenticity is another one of those three facilitating uh, factors or necessary and sufficient conditions for therapeutic growth. And this involves the sharing of self by relating in a natural and spontaneous, open and genuine manner. Uh, the, sometimes this involves self-disclosure. And as discussed some in, in um, the other lecture, self-disclosure can be a, about the worker himself or herself and the worker's life, but also may have to do with uh, a response to what is going on in the session. The worker sharing their feelings uh, of happiness or sadness or humor or whatever it might be related to what, what is going on with the client in that, in that particular session. So there are self-involving statements such as, I'm impressed with how well you've coped with all this stress. I feel sad that you've had to deal with all this when you've had so much else to worry about. That that uh, really is kind of talking about what my feelings are, what the worker's feelings are, what in response to the content that the client is presenting. Um, or you can use these personal self-disclosure messages like I was saying, 
that reminds me so much of when I was raising my my teenagers or or here's the reference about you know you have a lot of problems being a first generation immigrant and I can relate to this because my parents immigrated 40 years and they you know etc 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 so the there's different kinds of ways to sh to make use of self-disclosure uh, in the process of being genuine and establishing genuineness in your relationship with a client you want to avoid sharing too many personal feelings and experiences until you've really established rapport and trust with your client. So, so less of this probably early in the relationship because we don't want the client to begin to feel that this relationship is going to be all about what's going on with the worker. It's about what's going on with the client. And so you want to wait till you have your relationship established to a certain extent before you begin to make too much use of, of, of self-disclosure. You know, and your intensity can be from very superficial to highly personal, although, again, as um, we've talked about elsewhere, we have to be very careful about boundaries and making sure that the self-disclosures, first of all, are appropriate, um, secondly, um, appropriate for a professional relationship, and secondly, um, that, um, well, that they just don't uh, go beyond the, the range of what uh, a client can be comfortable with as well. So for responding appropriately it's much the same kind of paradigm i or i'm sorry responding authentically is much the same kind of paradigm as as expressing empathy you know i and then you express your feeling a neutral description of the event and the impact on this on on you or other people so i'm sad when someone ignores my comments because it seems i'm invisible to them always best to use I statements not you statements again because you're taking ownership and responsibility for whatever it is that you're the message that you're sending um, you should be in tune with your feelings and share when it's appropriate and this is another caveat about this only when it's when it's helpful to the client not when it's helpful to you not when it gets something off your chest uh, not when uh, you know there's a, a void to fill in the conversation but when it's helpful to the client so, so self-disclosures um, are, are really to be used in the service of, of the treatment goals. And, and these, these uh, authentic responses can be cued by such things as when the client's messages request self-disclosure of you. Uh, uh, but again, you know, evaluate the, the appropriateness of the request. Um, if it's about your opinion about something, your observation, and, and evaluate whether or not that it's useful for the client to, to know what you're thinking about that, um, as well as when there's personal questions. There, of, of course, are places where I think uh, questions can become too personal and, and uh, probably inappropriate for the relationship, the nature of the relationship you have with your client. But sometimes also, you know, these authentic responses can be initiated by yourself, sharing your reactions to things or experience or, or sharing discomfort you have about a certain situation that's going on before you or about the client's behaviors, those kinds of things. Now, assertiveness is, I think, is a part of authenticity and, and genuineness, and it's, but it is also something that I think should be used at appropriate times and, you know, and again, carefully make sure that it doesn't become aggressive in nature. So a worker might want to be assertive at times, such as when um, it's necessary to make requests or to give directives. Um, if you have a re if you have a directive to make, don't make it sound like a request, but state what it is that you want the client to do in, in a polite manner. We, um, my uh, exchange students, a couple of them told me this over the years. In fact, that Americans have a way of being very roundabout when uh, we want them to do something, and sometimes we'll we'll turn directions into requests. And I can think of a time when, uh, you know. Uh, one of my uh, one of my kids' responsibility was to empty the dishwasher when it was run, and and um, he failed to do that. And it was the next day, and I can remember telling him uh, what I said was um, somebody didn't empty the dishwasher, and I hear coming from the living room, Johan. He says to me, uh "Oh, 
you're telling me I screwed up and dropped the ball and sort of a response back that kind of be more direct about things and 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 I've heard that more than once from from those kids that that we just have trouble with being direct with people so so when you if you have a direction make it a direction don't make it a request um, assertiveness can be helpful if you have to maintain focus or or if there's somebody who's interrupting things where you respond assertively um, so that there's no distraction from some important process that's going on. If there are problematic communications going on, uh, destructive communications, threatening arguments, those kinds of things at, between uh, between clients in in a group or in a in a family session or a marital session, you know, or during a home visit when you're when you're talking with parent and children together, you may have to intervene in that assertively um, and and. Um, be decisive and and um, now polite, but but firm and direct when you do that, so that the clients will respond to you. If the client's angry and may, may maybe isn't even expressing it uh, appropriately, or is expressing it to you, or it's underlying, you may need to respond assertively, assertively to that. But but also remember to use your empathy skills. Uh, in, in relating to what the client is experiencing and, and perhaps talk about your own feelings if it's appropriate as well. But, but remember boundaries and personal limits so that uh, you don't want to allow a client to be verbally abusive of you and, and those kinds of things because we need to teach those individuals who use that kind of technique that that's not okay in a relationship. And, and sometimes when you have to decline requests, you have to set limits with clients or whatever, uh, particularly with involuntary clients, sometimes with younger clients in particular, uh, where you have to uh, assume a certain kind of role as an enforcer or a mediator or something like that. Um, you, you may have to use this, your assertiveness skills there as well. So there's different kinds of times to remember, keep those skills honed and, and ready for use. There is a section in the, in the uh, I think it's chapter six in Hepworth that talks about verbal following skills. And these are um, specific kinds of responses that you have that will enable you to maintain contact with the client, psychologically speaking, on a moment to moment basis and to convey that you understand what's being said to you. This uh, has been these kinds of responses that have been shown to um, uh, to to uh, well to enhance clients satisfaction I was looking for some other terms for that but but to really to kind of you know to encourage the client to continue speaking and to end it gives the client the sense that you really are are listening to what's going on now uh, the, the text talks about two different kinds of variables that contribute to client satisfaction and and their desire to continue in a relationship and one is called stimulus response congru congruence and this is where your your responses provide feedback to clients that their messages are accurately received um, if if you uh, if you have an incongruent response to some message a client gives these are things that actually are associated with clients quitting therapy i mean if they, if they don't have a sense that you're listening to them and you're not responding in a congruent fashion to stuff that they're saying i mean why would they want to continue in in treatment with you the other variable is when the clients perceive that that your responses relate to their concerns uh, the concerns that they're expressing that's called content relevance so these two these two performance variables are something that are, are important in terms of uh, a positive client experience these uh, verbal following skills you're going to i'm going to show you a list of these things but they really help us um, obtain personal information much more in depth than we might otherwise attain and so there's a number of different responses that that uh, Hepworth and his associates go through in this textbook and I'm just going to touch on a few of these uh, furthering responses uh, go from uh, minimal responses and accent responses so minimal responses is when you're nodding your head remember uh, from another talk we don't nod our head repeatedly over and over and over again you know we don't want to wind up becoming a bobblehead in a in <laughs> you know sitting in a chair there because if if you do that too much that that seems false and and uh, it becomes very off putish and so but but occasional nodding of the head is 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 saying to the client i understand continue 
I get what you're saying, those kinds of things, as well as a mm -hmm and, and that kind of thing. These are very minimal responses. They don't, they, they encourage the client to go on, but they don't really shade or impact the direction of what the client is saying otherwise. Um, accent responses where you hear a client say something and you want them to go further than that and you might repeat some of the words of what the client said but in a questioning tone which then encourages the client to continue to kind of explain or, or enhance what it is that they've already told you. Reflection responses um, reflect content and affect. Sometimes it involves simply repeating the, what the client has said. Other times it involves a much more complex kind of thing where you're adding emphasis to to uh, convey that the, the picture is pretty complex. Um, and, and perhaps uh, even reframing what the client has said. So a, a reframe, for instance, um, the client is talking about feeling a bit like a failure saying, I've gone through treatment three or four times. Maybe one of these times I'll get it right. And the worker's response to that in, in a reframe is, it sounds as if you've persisted trying treatment again after earlier disappointments, but you haven't given up on yourself. So that is taking, taking that, that sense of failure in the client's response and kind of framing it in a way that there's a positive takeaway from that, that, you know, you keep trying, you persist, you don't give up. That's, that's a, big, a big difference there. So those are, those are reflection responses. Closed in and open re responses um, are just like questions, you know, the closed questions restrict a response, whereas an open-ended response uh, encourages clarification from the topic. So um, a closed-ended question might be, when did you get your divorce? You know, how, uh, um, what time did you get the children off to school today? Those kinds of things. Instead of saying something like, tell me about your morning, you know, or, or um, how did, um, well, here, here's another example. Uh, you've mentioned your daughter. Tell me how she enters into your problem, you know, so that that opens the door for more discussion it, and the workers picking up on some some perhaps some significant things in the in the statements the clients making, but are, are moving past that might be important for them to, to talk over. Sometimes uh, it's, it's necessary for the um, client to become more specific for the worker to try to, to, to bring out more specific experiences in the client uh, or to check out experience, uh, check out the perceptions that the worker has or clarifying the meanings of the things that uh, the worker or that the, rather the client saying something like, um, I don't know that I'm following you uh, very well. Let me see if I understand the order of events that you just described. So the worker may then uh, repeat back what the worker perceives and asking the client to clarify and become more concrete and more specific in describing things. Um, I'm confused. Let me try to restate what I think you're saying. Uh, again, um, a, a following skill, a verbal following skill that seeks more concreteness and more specificity from the, from the client. And some other skills here, providing and maintaining focus when you're interrupting you know those dysfunctional communication styles, or perhaps you know where the where there uh, where there's argument going on, or there's a distraction, or um, uh, clients are taking you off on tangents and not sticking to the topic or avoiding avoiding the topic, and summarizing, which is often something that you're going to do at the end of a of a, a series of, of events in, in a meeting with the client, where maybe a number of different things happen, and you say, well, let me summarize what I think we just uh, we just saw here, uh, Mary said such and such, and you you responded by believing, or by saying that you believe such and such, and, and Mary agreed with you, and also agreed to do such and such. Is that correct? You know, that's a summarizing of things. Sometimes you do that at the end of, at the end of a meeting, so that everybody agrees that this is, this is kind of where we're at now after our talk today. So these kinds of things really help our clients to expand their, their awareness and, and touch on things like their motives and their emotions and beliefs uh, to understand how their behaviors affect other people and, and when sometimes those behaviors might be problematic. Now, way back in chapter 17, uh, and I couldn't understand quite why it was so far back until I, 
I read a little more about what the author was intending. Um, they talk about additive empathy. I thought that that really belongs more in this section rather than much, much later in the book. And the reason is, is that uh, I think the, the authors are thinking that for people who are very new to the topic of empathy and, and, and uh, interviewing people that it's better to introduce that much later, not to clutter the, the uh, learner with too much information is too advanced, but, but f for you all, I think, you know, this is something that really belongs really tightly connected to it. And additive, additive empathy, uh, I think in, in many respects is something that you're already, um, ready you're already using in your work you know so that that uh, really you're interpreting the forces that are operating within the client that produce all these feelings and thoughts and reactions and behaviors that you're that you're working with that you're trying to um, trying to perhaps starting to um, correct and so these these responses go beyond what the client expresses and and so it does require that you're inferring things it's not something that the client is saying, but that you're putting two and two together based on what the client is saying and kind of asking the client to checking out with the client if indeed this is what they're feeling or thinking. Um, so you, there's a certain amount of interpretation to this uh, that has to go on. And so you do this tentatively. You don't, I mean, you may make it as a statement, but you make that statement in a way that the client can come back and say, no, that's not right, or yes, it is. And sometimes, um, you don't want to use this. Sometimes the clients are going to tell you you're wrong, by the way, and that's fine. Then you, you, you acknowledge that, that you are misunderstanding what you're hearing or you're putting, you're putting things together incorrectly and ask the client to clarify a little more what is, uh, what is going on, what's, what's wrong about what you're thinking and how, you should, how should you be thinking so that really you're still getting at deeper things with the client, even if you're not right. So you don't have to be too afraid to try this out as long as you're using it in a tentative fashion. So the interpretation is the identification of the patterns and goals and wishes that the client implies, but doesn't directly state. And sometimes that that um, those things are really kind of below the surface of their consciousness, and so they're they're really not even in touch with what what's going on there necessarily. And and uh, you can either describe the client's experience according to your own vocabulary, so that when the client says they're frustrated about something you can say by frustrated I gather you're feeling hurt and disillusioned by your child's behavior you know that 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 frustration kind of that that statement kind of gets at what those feelings are behind that sense of frustration that, that the parent feels and really the hurt and disillusionment probably is more accurate and is more important to that parent and if you can imagine touching those deeper feelings and how that might help the client understand a little more about what's happening, what's behind those feelings, you know, something that can be very powerful. And then the propositional interpretation involves the worker's explanations that kind of connect to the causal relationships a bit among the factors in the, in the client situation. So the example here, when I hear you come back to maybe I'm not cut out for this kind of thinking, I hear what you're really saying is that you're becoming worried again about whether you can handle the licensing exam. You know, again, pushing below the surface to, to the deeper feelings, the deeper meanings of what the client is saying. That's additive empathy and interpretation. So you use this to identify deeper feelings, to assist the clients to become aware of emotions that, that really kind of lie on the edge of awareness, maybe just beyond that, con that level of consciousness. Um, those feelings are implied in the discussion, the things that the client says to you. Sometimes they underlie the surface emotion like frustration that we were just talking about, or it adds to the intensity of the feelings. Your side tells me that you don't feel good about this. So even connecting with nonverbal behaviors and, and what, uh, what those nonverbal behaviors communicate. You can use them to identify the meanings of feelings and thoughts and behaviors to help the client see what the motivation is behind those things and, and to look for patterns in areas like that. So you're worried that things could go mighty wrong here. It's a underlying feelings and thoughts, not something that, that they're saying necessarily, but, but you can see they're really what's really operating beneath the surface. You can use it to identify wants and goals um, that, that maybe aren't fully uh, recognized by the clients and sometimes that can really help the client to to uh, 
you know, begin to change action to start taking action in order to, to achieve those goals that, that uh, they have below the surface. Hidden purposes of behavior is another thing that additive empathy can help explore, um, helping the client to become more aware of basic motivations that underlie their concerns. So do you think maybe you set yourself up for rejection with your behavior so that you're the one in control? Something we see a lot with uh, with uh, kids, you know, that, that have troubled relationship with their parents. And so they act out in order to, to uh, prompt punishment that they think a rejection is sort of a rejection they can relate to because they think it's because of the way they're acting. When really kind of below the surface, they're really feeling more like they're rejected because of who they are. You want to be careful when you do these kinds of things because sometimes, you know, you can take clients a little too far and, and uh, this is going to talk about it in a minute that kind of just going to the edges of their consciousness, not too far beyond, but we'll touch on that in a second. Uh, you can use additive empathy to challenge beliefs uh, that, um, that your client might uh, state as fact. And here's an example of one where the person thinks that, uh, you know, they're not the kind of person that can be hired. And really what it, what it amounts to here is just that interviewing for the job and the, and the fear of rejection is, is pretty frightening to the to that client. And also unreal, um, t touching on unrealized strengths and potentialities that, and again, this is a little like that, uh, um, you know, it, it's a little like reframing in a sense in that, you know, you've been very creative in handling such in situations like this in the past, kind of giving them that, that kind of sense, that statement, um, pointing to things they've done in the past and everything to kind of help them feel, uh, find some strength at times when they're feeling very challenged by, by their circumstances. Now, again, you want to be somewhat careful about when you use these things. Um, and it, um, maybe, you, well, certainly you don't want to use it too often until you've had a good, solid working relationship established. You know, when you begin to kind of mine for underlying feelings and thoughts and, and motivations and things like that, you know, if you can imagine yourself in the other the other side of the discussion, if it's somebody that you don't really have a lot of trust in or that you're just getting to know, it, it, it might feel like a bit of a violation to have somebody kind of digging around under the surface with you. So you want to take some time and establish yourself with a client before you begin to make use of this too much. Um, and and uh, really, only when the client's open to explore what's going on inside. Uh, if if you've got a client that's closed off to that, that this is not a skill that you really want to make make use of too much. Um, and this says to pitch the responses to the edge of the client's self awareness. Um, don't don't uh, try to uh, get the client to recognize things that is that is just too far remote from their from their consciousness from their level of awareness and sometimes you know we we can see what's out there and what's going on with the client but but uh, again you want to do this in a way that the client's comfortable and can receive it and and also one that they're not going to deny it you don't want to disturb the client with what you're doing you you just want to kind of help them expand their understanding of themselves through this it's going to be very powerful in that respect Always make your interpretive responses in tentative terms. Don't make a series of them. Don't do one after another after another. Again, too much at one time is 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 just too challenging for 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 us to to absorb. Watch how your client reacts to those interpretations, and if you see that the client is rejecting, responding negatively, you know, acknowledge that maybe you made a mistake in that, and and uh, you know, express you know, show some empathy, express some empathic responses to the client's reaction, and and um, you know, just go back to the topic that you're discussing with the client, and and understand that. Uh, they're not always going to understand the message uh, the way it's intended. And so, uh, you know, just just be aware that you may need to adjust your, your approach some with this. Now, confrontation is, uh, 
you know, I, I've seen individuals who use confrontation in relationships, and and uh, I think I mentioned elsewhere about the the jackhammer approach to confrontation, where you just kind of bust through awareness and kind of get uh, down to what's below the surface really quickly and, and almost brutally in a sense. And the confrontation should be used as as Hepworth and his group says here to enhance the client's self awareness and promote change. It isn't something that you want to pummel the the client with and slap them around with by any uh, psychologically, so to speak. Um, it, it, it does involve facing the client with some aspect of their thoughts and feelings or behavior that is contributing to their difficulties. And the best way to go about this is if fostering what's called self-confrontation, where you know you ask your client questions that cause the client to reflect on their behaviors. It's not where you're you're saying what you see and you know and and telling the client you know when they're not recognizing their, their motives and you're telling the client what their motives are that's not the best way you want the client to really be able to examine themselves sort of through this process but sometimes you do have to use what's called assertive confrontation here where you connect thoughts and beliefs and values together in, in a sort of a declarative form that that kind of points out some of the discrepancies between their feelings and their thoughts and their behaviors and that's one of the things that you that you know motivational interviewing that's one of the skills that's used in motivational interviewing um, but again you know the confrontation is done in a way that that is um, sensitive to what's going on with the client it's not something that's so confrontive that the client is going to want to close down and not listen to you and that's what happens if you're too aggressive with this, with this so consider the stage of change when employing this technique if again if the client is doesn't even recognize that there's a problem, doesn't acknowledge there's a problem, or is only vaguely aware that there might be a problem, then confrontation may not be the, the tool that you want to use. Although employed properly, uh, it may be the, the, the tool that helps clients move from one stage to the next. It, if, if, again, you know, it goes back to your relationship too, if, if the client trusts you and likes you and respects you, the confrontation is probably going to go down much more uh, smoothly and, and more likely to be heard than, than if uh, it's very new in the relationship and, uh, or the client isn't, is, isn't trustful with you yet. But there are situations such as when there's a law violation or when somebody's, um, you know, there's imminent danger to self or others where confrontation must occur no matter what uh, stage of the relationship you're working relationship in is in and maybe even no matter how the client's going to receive them there there are those moments where you have to use a confrontation um, in, in those situations where danger is a, is in, uh, imminent but otherwise you know uh, make sure you have a good working relationship before you establish and uh, working relationship before you establish the use of confrontation in your work and, and then use it sparingly. It's good also sometimes when you when you do use the confrontation technique to follow it up with an emp some empathic responsiveness to to kind of help the work, the client know that you're still with them and you're still that you're aware of of what uh, that confrontation might be doing with it, with him or her. There's going to be anxiety when you present a client with confrontation. You can expect that. And again, that's probably one of the things that you want to address in, in your empathic response. And, and, and w whatever you do, don't expect that there's going to be an immediate change after a confrontation because this is new information for the client and he or she's going to need to incorporate that and, and kind of think about it some before they begin to act on it. Now a little bit about uh, the barriers, nonverbal uh, barriers to effective communication that we have, and um, we have to really kind of look at ourselves sometimes and and how we how we deal with other people in order to understand this. But you know our nonverbal behaviors can help us uh, be more effective with individuals and and improve our interviews, uh, but also they can be barriers to to establishing a positive relationship if we if we don't uh, practice good receptive behaviors if we're not demonstrating that we're paying attention if we're looking out the window you know or distracted by things out the window you know just showing that we're not really fully engaged with what's going on with the client um, um, sometimes we we uh, we miss the meaning of, of nonverbal actions 
in terms of cultural appropriateness and that's something when you're working with clients from a different culture to be aware of those kinds of things and and to to keep them you know keep them in your mind as you as you're interacting with clients uh, from other cultures look at your environment around you also is it an environment that's comfortable and shows some respect for the client uh, we touched on this before I think also in another talk where you know there's not a lot of clutter around and you know there there is uh, just indications that you have some respect uh, for the client uh, I had an example of this uh, in the OCS office uh, we we were on two different floors this was in Kenai. we were on two different floors and the first floor was where the um, the ia workers the initial assessment workers were established and so the new clients coming in uh, for interviews about investigations that or as follow-ups to the first contacts that they had with ia workers were well they were all really everybody was supposed to be coming in through the first floor but but particularly the ia the ia clients sat in you know there waiting for the worker to come get them and the second floor was where the um, most of our foster parents came in and uh, and uh, the, the parents who were working to get their kids back were coming in and one of the um, posters that the agency started distributing was about adoption and um, there was a whole series of, of posters you know to encourage people to consider adopting children and those kinds of things and somebody went in and hung them up in the in the lobby of uh, of our first floor reception area where our where our intakes were occurring where the where the our investigation clients were coming in and and you know I had a problem with that and I, I wound up having it taken down because I thought that if if we're trying to tell our clients that you know we want to work with them to help them improve their situation and they come into a room where there's a bunch of posters that imply that we might take your kids away and give them to somebody else that's a that's sending a very bad mixed message and that's a good example of a nonverbal behavior serving as a barrier to establishing a positive working relationship so and and another thing and and this is this is a terrible thing in our this day and age it used to be you know we would tell workers or we tell our receptionists don't put calls through to us when we had a client in our office but now you know aside from that we all have our own phones in our hands and and some of us are kind of compulsive phone checkers or the phone dings while we're talking to somebody because a message has come in and we might glance over at it or whatever really if you can't turn your cell phone off at least silence your cell phone don't look at your cell phone during interviews with the clients. Uh, don't be taking calls. All those kinds of things communicate uh, an absolute lack of uh, lack of connection and a lack of being being really present with them. Now here's um, a couple of panels that are going to that look at kind of nonverbal communication and the kinds of things that that workers can do that are recommended and not recommended, like about eye contact and warmth and concern and you know keeping your eyes at the same level uh, sometimes you know some offices the workers have big chairs and the clients have little skinny chairs and if much as possible uh, it's a good thing to kind of level that off some at least be sure you're at the same level and if you if at all possible sit in chairs that are very similar to to the to the client try not to sit behind desks have barriers between you now, um, well, we'll get to that in a second. But you know, I noticed something here about lifting eyebrows critically is not recommended, and and I, it, this just tells me that some of this is really relates, or really depends upon the kind of relationship with that that you have with your client. That, um, I, I, and I think about that because I used to use my eyebrows sometimes in my work with um, with adolescents. So if you have teenagers that are uh, you know solidly in that formal operation stage you know where they 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 can understand abstractions and those kinds of things and you know I, I just had a good solid relationship with a with a with an adolescent client and uh, he, he or she might have said something that just was kind of you know totally <laughs> wrong I mean I, I don't know quite what to say but and, and and you have a sense that they really know that whatever it is they're whatever they're expressing is something that's not appropriate or is not you know is not really suitable to their situation uh, you know sometimes I would just kind of rather than responding to that I just kind of raise my eyebrow look at them and communicate non-verbally to them what I'm thinking and you know they get that and they they laughed about it and and it was kind of a nice humorous way to Kind of convey that I wasn't accepting what they were saying, and and um, 
so I, I think sometimes these nonverbals, if you have a good solid relationship with your client, you can use some of those things not recommended. Um, <laughs> but it depends just, uh, you know, in, in, uh, on the nature of your relationship. But look at your posture and, and uh, what you're doing with yourself. Are you squirming in chairs? Uh, you know, do you, do you lean back and place your feet on a desk? Again, as I mentioned elsewhere, sometimes in some relationships, I found that that really helps to put people at ease. But it depends on a lot of different things. You know, and in some cultures, well, you don't want to put your feet up towards another person so they see the bottom of your feet in any culture but but in some cultures that is an absolute sign of disrespect and so just got to be cautious about these things here's some other uh, recommended and non-recommended non-verbal communication issues and these are things that were also talked about in our other lecture as well uh, physical proximity uh, sometimes you have if you don't have interview rooms you know you have very small offices and I've had work situations where it was just terribly uncomfortable the, the rooms were so small and you just have to do what you can to try to you know put some a little bit of comfortable distance between you and your client because it can be very threatening to many people to be to be sitting too close to them um, you know that we were told one time too if you're furnishing an office and you've got clients coming in uh, make sure your client chairs have arms on them because uh, that's something that for a lot of people, if they can hold on to, they can put their hands on, on, on the arm of a chair. It gives them something to kind of grip when they're talking to you, if they have a little bit of anxiety or whatever. Uh, it's a good thing to have there. So look at the kind of the nature of the furnishings as well. Unfortunately, you don't always have control over those things, but when you have an opportunity to you know have input about those things, these are the kinds of things that... Uh, are probably very very useful and and frankly i think um, unless you're in a situation where you have to absolutely convey authority in your role which you might have in social work from time to time uh, and you know where you or and or where there's a safety issue and you need to keep a barrier between you and your client turn your desk around don't don't put the desk between you and your client it it, it uh, just conveys too much in terms of distance and separateness and uh, aloofness, I believe. So there are verbal verbal barriers to communications to eliminate, and and here are many of them. You know, I mean, uh, don't use reassuring, don't use patronizing statements. You know, you'll get over this with time. Don't worry. You know, things will be better. Tomorrow's another day, or you know, those kinds of things. Don't provide false reassurance. So, you know, things are going to get better tomorrow. You know, don't. You know, one of the things we used to tell our protective services worker is, um, you know, to make promises uh, that, that you can't keep, you know. And so, so uh, the, you know, things are going to get better now. You know, you don't know that things are going to get better for your clients. You hope that they will. That's what you're trying to do. But sometimes, even if they are better from an objective standpoint, they're not better in, in, in your client's mind. I, I can remember... Um, when I worked at the uh, children's shelter in Orlando, uh, a worker who had this need to calm children down in the shelter um, when they were first placed there and they would tell them, tomorrow there's going to be a court hearing and the judge might send you home then, so just try to relax tonight. When that worker knew three out of four times at least that that child was not going to get returned home the next day. And and really it wasn't to reassure the worker or the cl the child, it was to get the worker out of that situation. And and uh, don't make promises you can't keep. Okay, well that's, that's a bit of a tangent to that, but other kinds of things, giving advice and suggestions, uh, especially prematurely, being too sarcastic with clients, uh, judging statements, um, diagnosing, analyzing, threatening, stacking questions, you know, too many questions at one time or asking leading questions, interrupting at the wrong time, not letting your client finish their statements, being dominant, um, 
parroting client statements over and over and over again, using cliches and, and that kind of thing. Also, you know, another thing that used to irritate the heck out of me is when when uh, older people try to use uh, teenage jargon, the thinking that they're going to connect with, with the teenagers. You don't connect with teenagers by using words that they know you don't typically use in your in your discussions. You know, oh, that's awesome. You know, it's one of those phrases. Um, Okay, so there's a lot of different kinds of things here where, where um, you know, different kinds of barriers that that are going to really block your your ability to communicate effectively with your client, and it won't help you in your in your treatment relationship. So just in closing this here, I mean, workers need to we need to interview, or rather, to monitor our interviewing style for. Uh, all those little counterproductive patterns of responding that we may have, you know, and um, audio tapes were the things that we used a lot. And, and uh, I know now we do videotapes and, you know, you can video, you can video yourself with videotape, you video yourself on, you record yourself on your phone easily enough. Um, when I was in grad school, it was uh, quite a production to do uh, uh, video we did do them. We had to go to a lab to do them, you know, to do videotapes of, of our interviews and things. But uh, you'd be surprised at how much you learn from audio tapes. And we did do audio recording of interviews. And and uh, you, you learn so much about yourself just from listening to how you respond to a client. And if you can get the client's permission, and you always have to make sure the client knows you're doing that and gives permission fully, probably have them sign a, you know, a an informed consent document uh, in addition to that but um, and then make sure the client knows exactly who's going to hear it and how long you're going to keep it that kind of thing um, sometimes it's it's useful to just to listen to yourself in a real live interview with another person or to watch a video uh, if you have that opportunity that capability as well because you'll find you have all sorts of little verbal tics and habits and things like that that uh, maybe distract from what you're doing but you'll also find, and this happened with me as well, um, that maybe you uh, do some things right that you didn't realize as well. And, and uh, that can be very, very helpful to you. So, so look for your ineffective responses, but also look for the things you're doing right when you do record yourself. Um, but you can always gauge how effective you are by watching how your client reacts to you and the things that you say. And, and you know, if the, if uh, the client's well, as this says, ignore you, ignores you, or looks confused, or becomes more superficial, argues, gets up and walks out of the room. I hope that doesn't happen. These kinds of things will tell you that, you know, that you're not responding effectively. And so, so watch for those things. Engage by by using, uh, you know, watching your client's reaction to what you do. You know, and in, in in the course of the interview, you're you're working to modify uh, ineffective responses of your clients while you're doing this. You know, but but. Uh, be sure to be working on yourself too, because as this, as this um, slide says at the end here, that we influence each other. If your client is still exploring the problem, staying on topic with you, following, and maybe expressing those emotions that have been hard to express, and you know is willing to pl plunge deeper into self exploration and volunteers more information, this is the kind of thing that tells you you're responding well to them. So there's some. Some little tips, I think, that very, very useful tips in this textbook as far as how to communicate effectively and how to, how to improve your, your, your uh, working relationship with your client. So that's it for this. I hope it wasn't too long. It seems to have gone by pretty quickly. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. We'll be talking again.